This is an awkward and messy device to film, so I'll give you a demo of it uh, before I empty it out so we can take a closer look without getting splooge everywhere. Because this is an automatic foaming soap dispenser, and when turned on, as soon as you put your hand underneath, it squirts a portion of mousse into it, just general soap. So I'm going to uh, clean things up now, and then we can take this to bits and see what makes it tick. Okay, the situation is defused, the soap has been removed, and I'll just take the batteries out of this. Oh, it's just, oh, no, no, it's actually, I'm putting my fingers under it and it's splooging everywhere. Excellent! Uh, I shall press a little button on top, it's a touch contact, and then I shall quickly pop the bottom off it and take the batteries out, because this one uses standard AA batteries. You could use rechargeable if you wish. Uh, there are other versions that you plug into a USB charger to recharge them. I've got one, but it's got a very irritating habit of just randomly turning itself off. I think it may be crashing. Let's get the last bit of soap out there. Right. Now, how does this open? I think it all opens from the top, and I think... I don't think there's any obvious screws, so I'm going to have to get in with a spudger. Hopefully it's not sealed. I don't think there's going to be anything subtle about this. It's very good. I have to say I quite like this. The soap it uses is just ordinary washing up liquid diluted. Well, certainly that's what I use. Oh, this is promising. This is promising. Oh, that was promising. It's just clipped back together again. Right, this is one of these that uh, I have to try and work my way all around the sides. Oh, that's not too bad. That's not too bad at all. I can see the circuit board already. The circuit board is, seems to be mounted in the lid, which kind of makes sense because there's a touch contact in the lid. And it also means that if water gets in, it's not going to get down there. Right. Everything is being done in that motor down there. So let's unplug uh, all these bits and I shall analyse the circuit board. Oh, that's one of those connectors that when you try unplugging it, the whole connector lifts up. One connection. Is this a uh, motor? This says motor, that's good. And uh, this will be the battery. Excellent. Let's get the circuit board off for a start. Screwdriver. Where is my other screwdriver? I've misplaced it momentarily. There it is. So, two screws hold this on. And we have a spring, perhaps? Yes, we have a spring. This is the touch contact with a blue LED underneath it. That's really all there is in the back. And a massive sort of ground plane. Lyson, it says. So uh, the soap you use in these things, you basically get your favourite hand soap, but you dilute it down. If you try putting it in at full strength, like standard pump action uh, gel soap, it just won't pump properly and it won't aerate properly. So in my case, I put into the container, I typically put in about 20% washing up liquid and then top the rest up with water. And that makes a very foam ball liquid. Right, I'm going to analyse this, but I'm also going to get this pump out because this pump is doing magical stuff. Duff. And I'm interested to see exactly what that is. Right here. One moment, please. Okay, the reverse engineering has been done. The pump is by far the most interesting bit here because it seems to be a specifically designed moose pump. So the battery supply comes in here and it immediately gets decoupled with capacitors and goes to this 3.3 3 .3 volt regulator. That then powers the microcontroller here. And that deals with everything in a series of modules. So for the input from the touch button on the top of it, it's got an LED between these two contacts. So it's powered from probably a 3.3 volt rail directly via this 220 ohm resistor and then to the processor so it can actually turn the LED on and off. The touch button itself is a spring connected via this 1K resistor to this chip here, which is a dedicated touch button chip with a couple of resistors, and then it signals over to the microcontroller. For the infrared sensing, and this is the most complicated bit, for the infrared sensing, the processor is pulsing this transistor and there's an infrared LED. Let me just show you the infrared LED here. So this is the sensor board. And if I pull off this little rubber cap, 
you'll see there are basically an infrared LED and receiver. And the LED is being driven with a series of high current pulses. It's only got a 10 ohm resistor in series with it. And then, the, uh, so that goes from positive to the LED, and then the LED is switched by this transistor to the zero volt rail. Um, and the transistor is turned on from the processor via this simple 1K resistor. So that is uh, firing a series of pulses, and that will be a bit balance on power saving that will be involved here. And now, is it modulated or is it just a fixed pulse? I'm not sure. Um, the input has a very basic filtering from the sensor, and then it goes over to this fairly analog section of circuitry based on an LM358. And an LM358 is an op amp. And that is used for actually sensing variable voltage levels. So I'm wondering if this has got a fixed voltage threshold or if it's got some way of auto gain to actually try and compensate for if uh, there's a lot of interference in the, the vicinity. You know, if this has been put pointing into a bright porcelain bowl or something like that. It seemed to only detect within about a couple of inches and that seems to also vary to a degree with the battery. Uh, so when it detects the reflection of your hand, uh, incident the rubber little pad here, the little cover, is to stop crosstalk between them. It's to stop it de detecting light shining out the side. It's kind of important. I did a lot of experimentation with infrared sensing in the past. And this block, this barrier between the emitters, uh, makes it only sensitive to obstructions in front and not disturbances in the vicinity. When this signals back to the processor that MUS is required, it then sends control down to this uh, transistor here. It's got a 100 ohm resistor uh, between the processor to the uh, base of this transistor. And then it's got a pull down resistor to keep that turned off normally. And then all we've got here is the motor itself. We've got a noise suppression capacitor and we've got the back EMF uh, diode. So it's all very textbook as you'd expect. It's all very modular, but let's take a look at the pump because the pump is by far the most interesting bit. I have taken some of these pumps apart in the past. So it's based on this a swash plate style approach. It's got a cam in here that is off center. It's an eccentric cam. Uh, so as that rotates, the pin that's inserted into it on the back of these uh, rubber diaphragms, uh, I'll zoom down this a little bit. As it rotates, it makes the diaphragms undulate backwards and forwards. And uh, if you were to see it from the front while it was doing that, it would look like that. You'd see these diaphragms all basically pumping backwards and forwards at very high speed. Notice that this diaphragm here is smaller than these two big ones. These are the air ones, this is the liquid one. Taking a look at the layers, we have the... There's the, the front of the diaphragms, and in front of that is this plate. This is normally face down onto that, and these little discs, see the two black discs? There's also a clear uh, silicon disc here covering one hole. That's the liquid intake with a single hole. The other ones all have multiple little uh, holes around. They've got about four around each to allow the air in. And these are basically called umbrella valves. They're a disc of silicon with a little uh, pin with a catch in it that when you push it in and it clicks in or you pull it in, it just drag it in, it latches. It means that uh, when the air is pressing down the way, it will actually push against that and it will close the valve. But when the pressure is on the other side, these tiny little valves just lift up and uh, it lets the air flow through. Very, very simple. Uh, there's another one though another side, and it's this one here, which is somewhere on the bench. I've misplaced it slightly, but that's all right. I have misplaced it. But it goes on the other side here with where this uh, triangular, I'll zoom down this a bit. So this is the other side of that. Those are the little black umbrella valves, the little clear ones over here, and then another valve sits on here. And when the Cylinders are pulling down, they draw air in via these black and the 
detergent in via this clear one. But when it's they're pushing up the way, they all feed into the central area here, and that valve allows the liquid to flow out the way, but stops the suction going back in. Zoom back out again. Oh. Uh, that plate then couples on with this uh, ceiling gasket onto the main front of the unit. This is the part of the unit that has the two pipes. And the central pipe is the output pipe. That's the one that's got that large, oh, there it is. There it is. It's the fairly stiff umbrella valve. Uh, but it is uh, effectively pushing out into this area, and that is the central output port here. The inlet involves liquid coming in through this hole, and you'll see that's a closed off section there. And these sections are joined down here. And I was wondering, where does the air? It took me a while to work out where the air's coming in. See how this uh, screw support here is shaped slightly differently? It's indented in. There are two little holes under there that actually lead into the outside, so that uh, that position. You might see this, you might not. I'll, I'll zoom and you can see if you can see it. Can you see the tiny little air hole down there? And there's one at the other side as well. They are the air inlet for the unit. So when this unit's running, these three cylinders are going in doubt. One is pulling in a controlled portion of liquid via this pipe, which is the detergent inlet pipe. And the other ones, the larger ones, are pushing, are pulling in a fairly large quantity of air from the outside of the unit, and then they're all being combined and then pushed together. And this is where, if you just did it on its own, it would be fairly coarse bubbles. I shall put this out the way. But the hose then leads to the outlet, but it's interrupted by this little thing here. This hose, these hoses have springs in them. That's just to stop them being kinked. They can't be crushed if they're folded because it's it's just uh, because there's a lot of sort of change of direction in the machine, so it just keeps it from being folding flat and kinking, which would stop the foam going through. But uh, before it goes out of the machine, it goes through this device, and when it goes through this device, it contains it's glued shut, unfortunately. But I can see inside by pointing the light down it. I can see inside there is just a a mesh, a foam, almost like a, a puff of a uh, fibre. And as the big bubbles go up through that, uh, they soak the, the fibre with this sort of detergent and then the air continues to blow through and it creates that a mousse, a thick foam comes out the other side. And I'm going to reassemble the pump now. And I'm going to test that. I'm going to test a before and afterwards just to show you what it looks like. So, one moment, please. Okay, the explosion containment pie dish is about to become the foam containment pie dish. I've got a fairly long length of hose into this, so I want to actually see how fast it actually pumps liquid. Let's try this. Are you ready? It goes at a fair lick. And it comes out, well it's trying to blow this spring out, it comes out as a fairly coarse foam. Right, tell you what, now I shall take that spring out actually, and I shall put this little foaming adapter in, and after this it should come out much more moussier. Oh yes, much thicker. Mmm, yeah. <laughs> Uh, right, so there we have it. It's the foaming mousse pump. It's quite nice in its own right for just creating a continuous stream of mousse. I'm going to regret that now because I have to turn the power off. Oh no! But uh, there we go. Uh, and now I have to dry my hands before I can uh, really turn the camera off as well. Alright, okay. So that's it. It's actually quite a nicely made unit. It works well, this one. It has a decent sensing range. It's, un it, you know, it uses... Uh, AA batteries. I suppose it'll be fine with the rechargeable ones. Um, but uh, so far with those ones, I've had a really long uh, run time. I think I've got about three uh, canisters of this and it's lasting a good length of time. The only thing I notice is that the range gradually decreases. But there we go. Uh, that's what's inside one of those.
I wasn't expecting the custom pump. I thought there was going to be maybe one motor running a small peristaltic type or a piston pump to pump the liquid. And then I was expecting a little bellow type assembly to actually blow the air. But it's quite neat that they've basically adapted um, a standard um, swash plate type uh, low voltage air pump to actually have one of its three cylinders actually pumping a small quantity of liquid so it can basically create mousse on demand. Very neat. I like that.